So now in this final flowchart of Reproduction 1, we're going to be concluding our look at the male reproductive system by talking about the hormones that drive the entire reproductive systems that are seen within males. And in order to understand that, we'll entitle this last flowchart Male Endocrinology. So we've looked at the endocrine system in previous lectures, and now we're going to be looking at the specifics that males are going to be related, the relationship that males specifically have to the endocrine system and the endocrinology within them. Male endocrinology is all about looking at androgens. So andro is a Greek root, and it means man. And so now we're talking about here are going to be hormones. These are the principal sex hormones that govern sexual reproduction in males. So they're the main sex hormones. In addition to this, the major one of interest to us when we're studying endocrinology is, of course, it's very famous, it's testosterone. Now we've mentioned testosterone here and there in a couple of different lectures, but now we're going to be explicitly looking at how testosterone is going to be involved in driving the entire male reproductive system and development. So we consider testosterone the most important hormone, more specifically the most important androgen, if you want to be more specific, a sex hormone that's going to be involved in sexual reproduction in some way, shape, or form. So that's our androgens. So the best way to understand male endocrinology is actually by looking at a hormone cascade. And we're going to be looking at a hormone cascade pathway seen in males. And this cascade pathway, as we've seen in previous endocrinology videos, um, it's going to be basically looking at the start, which is always the hypothalamus, and going through the different routes and messages that are going to be sent and through, sent throughout the body hopefully for a very specific reproductive response. Take a look at figure 46.13, and this figure shows this hormone cascade pathway that's directly involved in male endocrinology. So again, we usually always start at the hypothalamus. Remember, this is a structure within the brain. It's essentially the principal endocrine gland and endocrine structure within the brain. It's a neuroendocrine structure. And therefore, at the hypothalamus, we're going to have the release of a very important hormone called GNRH, gonadotropic releasing hormone. Remember when we have R, releasing, this means we want something to happen. It's the opposite of inhibiting. So this is going to be gonadotropic we have to go to the gonads. That's why it's tropic also, because it's going to have an effect at a different organ beside the brain. So the brain hypothalamus will release GNRH. GNRH will enter the pituitary portal vein. Remember, this is going to be a vein that's going to be uh, sort of a blood highway that can easily, uh, that hormones can easily hop onto. Whenever we're looking at the pituitary portal vein, that means we're going to be going towards the anterior pituitary. Once we have reached the anterior pituitary, we have a message that we are carrying. That message is GNRH. GNRH will go to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary will recognize that we need gonadotropic releasing hormone response. The response to that are, is going to be two separate gonadotropins. The anterior pituitary will produce and secrete two gonadotropins because GnRH told it to. So these gonadotropins, remember, when we see the word tropic or tropin, this means that this will stimulate other organs. That's what tropic means. And the specific organs that we're looking at here are the gonads. Um, and let me just rewrite this correctly. I spelled it wrong. Gonadotropins. There we go. So remember, we're looking at tropic hormones that are going to go to the gonads and cause a separate response. What are the hormones of interest? The first one is called LH. LH stands for luteinizing hormone. So luteinizing hormone will be released from the anterior pituitary because of GnRH, which was released from the hypothalamus. LH, after it's released from the anterior pituitary, will hop onto the blood highway and go all the way to the gonads because it's a gonadotropic hormone. Its target, therefore, will be at the gonads, but specifically what we'll say is that the target is equal to the Leydig cells. L-Y-D-I-G cells. These Leydig cells are found within the testes structure. And the Leydig cells are named after Franz Leydig, who discovered them in about 1850. So these are named after somebody. What are the Leydig cells then? 
Leydig cells themselves, after they receive LH from the anterior pituitary, from the blood that's reaching the testes region, the Leydig cells will then respond to this message of LH. And this LH message will say and tell the Leydig cells, LC over here, to secrete androgens. And so remember, androgens are principal sex hormones like testosterone. So the Leydig cells will therefore secrete testosterone. So now we're going to see the specific uh, physiological response and effects that testosterone has based off of this very fancy hormone cascade that we just went through. So testosterone, why is it important? Well, first and foremost, you absolutely need a great amount, high levels of this principal sex hormone for the process of spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis is impossible unless you have a high amount of testosterone because testosterone is what's going to drive this process of making sperm. So if you look at a healthy individual, an individual that is producing high levels of testosterone at the correct rate, they will essentially have between 15 to 200 million, 15 to 200 million sperm per milliliter. So this is sort of a, the sperm count that we're looking at, sperm per milliliter of the ejaculatory fluid, the semen. So 15 to 200 milliliters is a healthy amount. That's a healthy sperm count. Why is it healthy? Well, that person is having the correct high levels of testosterone being produced by the Leydig cells at the spermatogenic regions like the seminiferous tubules. So, of course, this Leydig cells will be very much related to the seminiferous tubules because that's where we also have spermatogenesis specifically. But if we look at, let's say, an individual who classifies as somebody who has a low sperm count, and there are many individuals that do have this, this usually, this low sperm count usually begins to arise as we age, as males age. A low sperm count is anything that is less than 15 million sperm per ml of semen. And that's going to be when somebody's not producing as much testosterone. And you actually stop producing as much testosterone as you used to when you get older. As you get older, some men suffer from a, uh, a diagnosis called low T, low testosterone. And there are going to be uh, medications they can take to improve their testosterone levels in order to help this happen. Um, and, and also to order to help other secondary characteristics. Speaking of those, um, testosterone is also going to be a principal hormone of puberty. It's going to be a principal hormone that drives puberty. Puberty is essentially going to be sexual maturation in males and also females, but specifically in males, it's driven by the testosterone sex hormone, which is the principal major sex hormone. This is going to cause things like the adolescent growth spurt based off of a different hormone cascade, but still reliant on testosterone and growth hormone as well, combination of both. So you need both of those for the adolescent growth spurt. And in addition, puberty will result in different sex characteristics also developing. These sex characteristics can only develop if puberty is happening. Puberty can only happen if testosterone levels are high enough and are guiding the puber puberty process. So the sex characteristics are broken down as either primary sex characteristics or secondary sex characteristics. These are both going to develop throughout puberty. The primary sex characteristics are those that are directly involved in reproductive organ development. So repro organ development, DEV for development. So this is the development of mature sperm. This is the development of mature testes, mature overall structure within directly involved reproductive organs. Basically, all the organs that we talked about and structures we talked about in the reproductive system, uh, male reproductive system flowcharts, all of those are going to mature successfully and properly and as a primary sex characteristic after and during puberty. Secondary sex characteristics are those that are a lot more visible. Primary sex characteristics aren't really visible, they're mainly internal, but secondary are very visible. These are visible signs of manhood, let's say. These are things like facial and also body hair. Those are going to come as a result of puberty, as a result of a testosterone increase. Also things like a deeper voice, the deepening of the voice is a secondary sex characteristic, and also increased muscle development. Again, all physical, viewable things that are mainly secondary sex characteristics as a result of puberty, which comes from testosterone levels, which come from Leydig cells, etc., on this hormone cascade pathway. 
And then finally, the last gonadotropin that we'll look at is FSH. So we'll do FSH over here. And let me rewrite that. FSH. This stands for follicle stimulating hormone. This is going to be important in the development of the seminiferous tubules. So let me rewrite this over here. DEV of ST, as seminiferous tubules are where spermatogenesis occurs, and they are going to be highly regulated by the release of FSH from the anterior pituitary towards the testes, specifically the seminiferous tubules. What do FSH, what does FSH actually do in terms of development? FSH stimulates different cells, not Leydig cells, but actually stimulates um, Sertoli cells, which are again named after the person who discovered them. That person was Enrico Sertoli, an Italian physiologist in 1865. So these Sertoli cells will be stimulated by FSH within the seminiferous tubules. What are Sertoli cells? What are their job? Sertoli cells, upon their stimulation, will then secrete a different hormone. They actually secrete something else. It's called androgen binding protein. ABP. So what's going to happen here is that this is going to be a structure that specifically binds to a hormone that is produced by LH or as a result of an LH increase, which is testosterone. So let's say Leydig cells produce testosterone, right? They're going to then, the testosterone that's produced is going to bind to something called ABP. Why is it binding to the testosterone hormone? Well, that's because once it binds to the testosterone hormone, ABP, it essentially maintains and ensures that there's going to be high levels of testosterone. But specifically, you have to make sure that there's high levels of this principal sex hormone at the correct location. And that's going to be in the testes because that's where you need it to be. You need these high levels here in order for spermatogenesis. As we stated right here, how do you make sure that testosterone doesn't flow throughout the body? You make sure that it's sequestered. That's the term that we use. We make sure that it stays sequestered. So ABP sequesters testosterone to stay within the testes, to stay and maintain a high level at that structure, at that region, in order to ensure proper spermatogenesis, proper puberty, proper overall sexual development. And then finally, FSH is also going to be inhibited. So it uh, follows a negative feedback loop, and it's inhibited by a different hormone called inhibit. Not too hard to remember. And this is going to be a peptide hormone separate from FSH that acts negatively to it. This is a peptide hormone that's secreted by the Sertoli cells as well. So if the Sertoli cells notice that there's too much FSH, they will secrete a opposite hormone called inhibin to decrease the amount of FSH that the anterior pituitary is producing. And that covers our look at male endocrinology and the male reproductive system as a whole. As you can see, it's a very expansive process. It's very important to recognize that everything in the male reproductive system is there for a purpose, for either the spermatogenesis or the delivery of sperm. Hopefully, you've gained a greater appreciation of this incredibly complex, yet incredibly crucial system that is going to harbor half of life, let's say. And we'll look at the other half of life that's harbored within the female reproductive system in the next lecture.